I'm so glad quite a few showed up. I initially worried probably just me. <laughs> Um, so previously, we uh, on Wednesday we talk about classification tree. As I mentioned before, since we have talked about tree models before with regression, this is a fairly easy task for us. Uh, the main difference between classification tree and regression tree would be, uh, you know, this so-called impurity measure. That's uh, how we how we used to, uh, you know, decide where to split. So it's play the same role as residual sum of square. Is the mic working well, or I still have the boss sound? Is it okay? Okay, good. Um, so I talk about three different impurity measures, uh, misclassification rate, entropy, and Gini index. And in practice, we usually just use the first two. And also uh, mainly talk about what is the sort of mathematical difference between the first two, because one is a strictly concave function, another is a, um, it's a kind of piecewise linear. Where's my pen? Hmm. Um. Oh, here. Um, when I draw that picture, um, I said, well, let's consider the case where k is equal to 2. Mm -hmm. Um, so the misclassification rate would be a function like this, right? And you know, the sort of the maximum achieved when p is equal to half. When I say p, p means at a particular node, let's look at what is the percentage of one class. And then I draw the entropy, and I draw something look like this. Uh, I think I must have done some scaling to make sure the maximum match at a half. Because otherwise, I don't think the entropy for a half is exactly equal to a half. But that's that's not very important because all we all we care is the relative magnitude anyway. So I might have scaled that part. Um, and then I showed you well. I actually, I sort of went through very quickly um, for the classification tree. You can check the code. Uh, I used tree the package instead of a R part. <laughs> And here I just want to show you for that spam data. If you do your pruning, you can just use a prune.tree. The default choice, I think, is entropy. But you can also require to prune using misclassification rate. Then you're going to see something uh, slightly different. The two trees are actually different. Now, although the size might, might be the same, meaning the number of leaf nodes are the same. For example, on the left, this is your left, right? So on the left, whenever you see some uh, tree after the pruning, you get some two leaf nodes. They are siblings. They are the same label, and you know there must be, uh, I mean, the underlying pruning uh, criteria cannot be classification rate, right? Because you know you're going to merge this one. But you can see on the other, uh, on the other side, this is from a misclassification rate as the pruning criteria and you won't be able to see anything like you're going to predict two um, kids, the labels are, are the same. They, they usually are different. Okay, and then we um, switch to talk about um, and boosting because um, for a single tree, it's just difficult for a single tree to work well. And the idea of boosting just try to find uh, a crowd. Hopefully a crowd is going to work better than individuals. And so what is that? What are the individuals? We're actually going to include a lot of what we call the weak classifiers. Uh, that's just a way to say that we don't want to try too hard to pick a good classifier G. G could actually be any classifier. And uh, the underlying algorithm, the classifier is actually randomly chosen. So we describe the algorithm. And so the idea is just to sequentially pick some classifiers, G sub T, and at the end, we want to combine them using weights of a T. And because our um, label Y is actually labeled as 1 and minus 1, so when we uh, look at our final classification, we basically pick the sign. Mm -hmm. Look at the sign of the linear combination. And this is a more detailed description for the algorithm. We initialize, everybody get equal weights. And then at time T, we're going to uh, fit a classifier or just randomly pick a classifier. And then we're going to compute the training error with respect to that particular set of weights, because the weights will actually will change when, when t uh, changes. 
and then we're going to compute epsilon t, and then we're going to compute that mysterious alpha t, which is the half log of something. And, and it is possible the alpha t could be negative because if you happen to pick a lousy classifier when the arrow is bigger than half, meaning worse than random guessing, then you actually can have a negative alpha t. And then you can update your weights. And there's a nice interpretation about the weights and the updating of the weights. Suppose we pick a good classifier. So epsilon t is uh, less than a half. Then your alpha t is always positive because alpha, epsilon t is less than a half. So log that ratio should be bigger than, and you know, the log should be bigger than zero. Then how we update the weights and we look at uh, you know, every data point i, we check at yi times gtxi, like this guy. If the sign agrees, that means you, the car, and you're doing well on this class effect, on this data point, then we're going to downweight the weight. But if yi times gtxi is actually negative, meaning we're making a mistake, then we're going to actually um, increase the weight, try to do better next time, right? And so this is how we uh, sort of do a lift. We're going to lift the weights or down, uh, you know, drop the weight. Of course, we want to make sure at t plus one, those expression actually indeed going to be a set of weights, meaning the sum is one. So we have to put a normalizing constant zt in the uh, in the denominator. So the zt basically the number you sum over those guy over i, and and divide by the zt. And then this is how you just do your uh, sort of an effortless way of doing your uh, algorithm. At the end, just output this sign. And the last time we actually showed that, um, you know, when, when t is getting lar uh, larger, t is a number of iteration of your uh, algorithm. When t is getting larger, we can upper bound the training arrow. When I say training arrow, I mean the ordinary training arrow, meaning I look at my sample, I count how many got misclassified by my final classifier uppercase G subscript T. How many get misclassified and just normalized by the sample size? And you can show that training arrow is going to be upper bounded by some product and the, the, the normalizing constant. And it turns out you can show that for each of the ZT is actually strictly less than one. If um, it will equal to one if your epsilon T is exactly over half, but in most cases they're going to be strictly less than one. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then this is why you show the upper bound is keep decreasing, right? Now, before switching to the demo, I want to um, work with a particular example, okay? Because uh, this is ready with your quiz. <laughs> Consider a toy example where we have three observations. So observation is actually in, a, in, a, in, in two dimension, two features. We have uh, two samples are from class minus one. So sample one, two are from a minus one group, colored in blue. And the third sample is from the plus group, colored in red, okay? Then we can pick any um, classifiers. Uh, here, my classifier H could be um, what's, what they call the stump of a, a classification function, meaning you only split one of the features. So your H may look like something like this, or this, or this, okay? And we can do linear function too. So suppose we pick this classifier, because we randomly pick one. So this is my classifier. But still, well, I, have, I also have to decide which side is one, which side is negative one. So let's pick a classifier like this. And then we're going to predict this side is positive one, which means should be blue. This, this side is negative one. I should probably use blue on this side, right? So that means it's really a lousy classifier. Now, what is a classification error? Two out of three, right? You get misclassified two out of three. Sorry about the color, this should really be blue. So the error at the time for at iteration one, the error is two divided by three. Worse than random guessing. That's fine, let's keep going. And so what's our alpha one? Alpha one is a half log one minus epsilon one divided by epsilon one, okay? Now, I want you to start doing the calculation by yourself. So alpha 1 is going to be negative, right? Agree with that number? Okay. 
And then how we're going to use that uh, alpha one? We're actually going to remember initially initial weights will be one third, one third, one third for the three observations. And then we're going to start um, either going to increase the weight or um, you know decrease the weight. And what is that? Uh, how we increase or decrease? We have to evaluate the exponential of minus alpha one times y i h one x i, right? We have only three observations. Let's look at this product, y i times h one and x y. So you're gonna find so you're gonna find that this product will either equal to one or minus one, right? So um, if that product is equal to one, then we're actually going to um, increase the weight or decrease the weight. Increase the weight, right? So that means that's a point actually correctly classified by my edge classifier, mm -hmm. but we're going to increase the weight. Okay, somebody asked a question on the discussion board yesterday. That's the right thing to do. Usually we only increase the weight when you get misclassified. But because this is such a bad classifier, boosting will eventually use, will flip the sign. So boosting actually going to use minus hx1 as a classifier. Right? Because once you flip the sign, what's the classification error? It's one third. It's actually better, right? So that makes sense. Okay? So it makes sense to increase the weight for the third observation, although it gets correctly classified by my h sub one. Because you should really flip the sign of the for, for prediction. Uh, agree with this? Okay. So let's calculate the, 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 the weight. And I, I want you guys to calculate. What is the final weight for one, two, and three? I'm waiting for your answer. Oh, first check my statement. Is that true this exponential is going to be either one over the square root of two or square root of, uh, square root of two? Meaning we're going to either increase the previous weight by square root of, square root of 2 or we're going to downweight it by, you know, 1 over square root of 2. Okay. You don't need any rounding. You should get exact answer. Oh, maybe I should give you that, this expression. Okay, so uh, this wi superscript t um, is actually one third. You can actually ignore. You can ignore this one. It doesn't really matter because that's the same for everybody anyway. Okay, and then Oh, and I should show you that two. What the what the pick and um, what the data look like. We got two in class minus one, and one in class one. Anybody want to give it a try? One over what? One over three. One over, one over three. The square root of two is on the numerator or denominator. Okay. So we have, we have two of those, right? You're missing over like a custom, I think. Yeah? Is the sum going to be one? How to normalize this three number to make sure the sum is one? Mm -hmm. Sum, um, yeah, what's the number? What is this? If I normalize this three number to make sure the sum is one. 
a quarter, a quarter and a half. Yes, okay. Good, so you can do your calculation when you get, um, get back. Um, okay, then I want to switch to uh, show you the demo. Um, I sort of uh, did it very quickly last time. Uh, the file name is called um, old-boost, and I'll explain why I put a purposely put an uh, old there. Um, so I basically code the adder boosting algorithm, just very simple updating. Every time I just, so the data is one-dimensional. Every time I, just, I randomly put um, a location to split them into two groups. So um, what they're plotting here is the, this first row is the data, which is actually the label of the, of the data at every location. And the current is a classification arrow, a classification label for lowercase g sub t. And the bottom is a classification arrow for uppercase g sub t. Okay, so the bottom is a classification cumulative. I use a function, the sum of them over all the signs and, and over you know all the uh, over all the past uh, little um, small uh, lowercase g functions. Um, meaning, if I de decide to stop here, what I'm going to output is actually the prediction at the last row, not not the one in the middle, because this is only the classification. For that particular classifier, I picked at the tth iteration. So this is the very beginning, and the blue bar, everybody, um, you know, classified equally. Uh, sorry, weighted equally, and then based on the arrow, and that's the new weights will be the purple bar. So you can actually go back to and check this, and you can see how, um, you know, in the second iteration, and um, how the weights actually are ch changing, and. Somehow my overall is a bit strange. I should be able to see. Uh, well, you can play. You can you can play this. Um, you can try this a couple of times. You know, maybe t is getting larger. I think eventually you want to see um, at the bottom part. You well, actually, you can see. Um, you you can see some of the. Um, yeah, I want to be able to see. Um, you know the. See the classification arrow. The overall classification arrow is getting better. Um, well, let's see what's the arrow now. Well, previously I think the overall arrow for the uppercase G is 0.45. Now get improved to um, and 0.4. Um, so this is a picture I showed at the end of last lecture. What's shown here is the red dots are the classification arrows. So meaning. Um, this is a red dot where um, if I stop at iteration 50, what is the arrow if I take my uppercase G sub 50? And this is the overall classification arrow if I stop at 100 iteration, all the way to overall classification arrow if I stop at 200 iteration. And the arrows are not monotone, and what's monotone is the upper bound, the exponential upper bound, which is shown in that you know um, blue curve. Um, Okay, so for the um, for for ADA boosting, um, oops, as we just showed, it's okay to use a lousy classifier in in, in our algorithm where the arrow is bigger than half. Then um, boosting is actually flip the sign of of G, and. Um, also, although in our proof, it sounds like we're showing something monotonely decreasing, but that's the upper bound of the arrow. So the arrow is not actually monotone. And the last comment is, and the classifier returned by adder boosting um, is not guaranteed to have a good performance on any test data. And they're actually prone to overfitting, so we have to either stop early, use cross-validation to monitor the process, <laughs> or uh, we have to do regularization or you know some other things. So definitely, uh, add a boost, uh, any boosting alg algorithm can overfit. Now, and to show that stop early, um, I want to show you um, this part, my um, another toy example. So the toy example, I would, I'll just jump over um, to the picture. So. Um, the uh, blue circles and the red circles are data from, from my model. So what is my underlying model? And the um, black triangles are the conditional probability of y equal to 1 given x. Okay, 
So that means, you know, in this region, in this region, and the chance of being blue is, is uh, well, blue actually referred to, um, so red is class one, so blue is class zero. So in this region, when you're, here I didn't see how I sample my x, I just uniformly sample our x. So if your x is in this region, given x, the chance of saying y in blue, or it means in the other class, is high. In this region, the chance of saying, um, you know, in the middle region around like 0.2, and given x, your chance of y equal to one, which is uh, corresponding to the red circles, is bigger than half. So this is a conditional probability, okay? So what is the optimal decision boundary? It will be that bar I put in the middle. In this region, is, so the prediction over the x range would be um, um, blue, red, blue, red, and blue, right? So that if you knew the truth, okay? Um, Apparently, for the optimal decision boundary, you wouldn't expect a, sim a single split will work because you have to split multiple times, right? So let's try um, let's try boosting. Uh, I use G that's all the problem. I use GBM, and I just suddenly realized as I posted on the discussion forum, I think GBM um, is going to retire soon. They actually use GBM three. Um, so I have a bit of problem with to reproduce something I showed before. So I, I happen to save the uh, old output in a PDF file. So I'll show you that PDF file. Where is it here? So initially, I tried GBM. And oh, OK, you can see you, you kind of run my code. You just see uh, in, in this setting, my x is one dimensional, right? But I think the GBM has a trouble. And um, sometimes when, when the feature is one dimensional, it's really easy the coding. You may accidentally think it's still matrix, and you do your dropping, everything that caused a lot of error. So I think the very old GBM can handle this, but when I was teaching this course three semesters ago, two years ago, that GBM will always give me error message because um, that GBM cannot take one dimensional feature. Quite awkward. I think still right now, I don't think it can take um, one dimensional feature. Anyway, so um, if you run this directly, even use the GBM3, uh, I think you can have a trouble. So this is a case where I do um, I run 500 iterations. So that means my number of trees is going to be 500. No shrinkage. And I don't think I need to explain what shrinkage is after you guys have done your um, AIMS data. And so shrinkage is something uh, you know, when you do your boosting, if you add the whole tree into, your, um, into, into the forest, you can shrink the coefficients. So no shrinkage and use all the data to train every tree, and use five-foot cross-validation to check the test arrow, uh, CV arrow. So I run my iteration, I run this 500 trees, and then I ask GBM to show me, uh, to tell me how early I should stop, because I, I do have the 500 trees, and GBM is telling me, well, based on the CV arrow, you probably should stop just after you get the six trees. So you have to stop at iteration six. Now, what I'm plotting here, oh, sorry, this picture, it looks fine on my screen, but not so good on, the, on, the, on, the, on this big screen. So you can see those green, green um, you know, circles, those are the data. So at the bottom means you're from class zero, you're top, you're from class one. So this is what the data look like. And you can still see that gray colored triangle. That's a true y given x, the probability, right? Now, what I'm plotting here, those uh, you know, step functions, is my estimated probability of y equal to 1 given x. And then you might be wondering, because based on my um, um, adult boosting algorithm, I should just output the prediction, right? Where does that conditional probability come from? This is related to the question we had before with SVM. You know, you have a classifier, you, you're supposed to only predict the, the label, you know, one or minus one. And I said, actually, if somebody have a classification function, there, if there is an objective function, we always um, can link the connection between my conditional y given x, which is what I call eta x, with whatever output you give to me. Okay, so let me, let me just, um, I think I say too much. So let me show you um, um, my, my and I'm going to start writing on this. I still have some margin, so I can write. Uh, well, let me. Uh, so for, 
I think it's sort of a jump over the slides. Um, for ADA boosting, it actually minimizes the so-called exponential loss. So what is exponential loss? If you can still remember that uh, interesting um, jargon called the margin in SVM, and we even draw something like this, you know, we were going to look at the classification error in terms of the margin. Margin is basically y times fx. fx is our classifier. And we classify with the sign of fx. But we can still look at our own. But underlying, we're actually doing our objective function with respect to that numerical return, right? So for SVM, is a margin is, is something like, you know, do something like this, right? And for, sorry. You, um, so for ADA boosting, actually the underlying loss function is e to the power minus y times fx. If you can remember in the proof, we have this mysterious upper bound on the indicator function, okay? Because your margin, if the margin y times fx is positive, arrow should be zero, but that zero must be upper bounded by exponential function. If y times fx is negative, and if I look at my misclassification rate is one, arrow is one, of course it's still upper bounded by just exponential, that e, right? So we actually minimize in this. Now, if this is the objective function, then we can do our calculation. Well, I, I'm going to keep everything as uppercase. This is the objective function I'm trying to mini and, and, you know, minimize. Now, let's look at the expected. Um, this is the risk for a particular function g, right? Now our f only output, uh, f actually output uh, just a real number, okay? Then we're gonna play the same trick now. What is the optimal f that's gonna minimize this and, uh, you know, risk function? And we know how, we, and how we're gonna do this. We're gonna break the expectation iteratively. Outside expectations over x, and inside expectation is only y given lowercase x, right? Then we're trying to answer the question, what is the optimal value we're going to assign to fx, which is the value a? How to find the value a which minimizes this? I think this green is, uh, is, a, is an awful color. Why, why is only binary? So this actually is not too difficult to compute. Uh, I'm going to just start writing this in uh, the solution. So it's going to be um, e dot x times e to the power um, minus a plus 1 minus e dot x. Oops. e to the power now, what is e dot x? e dot x is the probability of y equal to 1 given x. And 1 minus e dot x is the probability of y equal to minus 1, right? So e dot x is given. Now you try to minimize this um, function, which is a function of a, right? How you find the optimal a? Take derivative, set it to 0. You're going to find out a it's going to be something pretty simple involving um, kind of a log of e dot over 1 minus e dot. There might be a square root outside, but it's it's very, it, you, you can find out what is that e dot. So this is where how I code it in my code. I'm going to switch to my, my boosting. So what I, once I, so once I uh, calculate the once I get my the output from my ADA boosting, which is that big G function, then you can see um, I I did some what well, this is a two point yeah. So I do my y dot predict. I get the outcome line capital X. Oops. Right. So you're gonna find out. This expression, which is, um, I, I cannot, yeah, uh, this, this, this expression is really the, how you grab that uppercase G out from your ADA boosting, not look at the sign, but at the actual value, how to make it um, 
and how to make it uh, related to e x, your prediction on the probability of y given one. Okay, so that's what I'm, I'm plotting here. Oops, my. Right here. So this is why I can draw this black stepwise curve. That's the um, estimated probability of y given one um, from my from my from my boosting algorithm. So I, I draw the estimated curve when the iteration is um, 10, 50, uh, 50 100, uh, 500. You can see how when I move on, how those uh, you know estimated curve and uh, sort of try to overfit the data. And doesn't look like the underlying two triangles. So you're gonna find out for this case if you stop early, and you're probably gonna pick something like the first picture that's better than the others. So this is an overfitting issue for SN for boosting. If you run it very long time, the training error can be small, but you know your own, your prediction error will be large. Okay. Now if you um if we now if we try an a thousand iteration. We're going to apply shrinkage. Whenever you apply shrinkage, you have to increase the number of iterations. And then still we use all the data and we do five-fold cross-validation. In this case, um, the optimal stopping point is, um, is 203. So you can see that curve is still better than the others. Um, I think and further you can change to um, you can start using um, set the, um, back the, the subsampling rate to be 50%, then your curve will be much more smooth. And this time, again, we stop at 200. So that one is still better than the others. Okay. So just this is, a, and this is an example I want to sh um, show you. Um, definitely for, for boosting, there is a danger of overfitting. That's number one. And number two, um, now, for any classifier, although uh, it sounds like it only gave you a label, but you, if you find out what is the objective function, you can actually retrieve the estimated probability on y given one and conditioning on x. Okay. Good. Um, right. So this is something I mentioned um, before, and let me just uh, state this again. So the boosting, and um, in fact, and um, is. I mean, the whole algorithm, other boosting algorithm sounds very uh, mysterious. And also, uh, I mean, it worked. And people are wondering, well, can we um, sort of take that idea to uh, apply on something else? In order to do that, it's better to understand sort of the underlying, um, um, you know, mathematical explanation for boosting. And so boosting is actually nothing different from a Grady algorithm. So what is a Grady algorithm? Now, if you think about the boosting, and we try to combine those so-called weak classifiers form a, a much more smarter um, crowd. So we wanted to find the combination of those um, classifiers. So we have capital G of them. So in some sense, we we have um, you know capital T um, classification functions, and we want to combine them with weights. So we have alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha t, right? So this is our final um, output, my f, my function fx. Uh, although so far I described boosting through um, regret and classification, but we know we can do regression too. So here the g function could be a classifier and could be a regression function. Um, if we wanted to find out what is optimal, how to um, pick an optimal choice for f, then we have to take the whole expression that summation over capital T terms and plug into our loss function, maybe add some penalty, and then try to optimize. It is going to be very difficult because we have uh, you know alpha one, alpha two, until alpha t. Not mentioning we probably also want to optimize over those g function too. So it's a it's a it's a very complicated classification problem. And so what we do, we use and um, you know forward stage wise and, and kind of a optimization strategy. Uh, we start with and um, nobody's in our in our bag of a uh, uh, you know um, uh, classifiers, so zero. And then at every time we first look at the first one. So uh, we don't have any model so far, and then 
we're first going to pick what is the optimal choice of alpha 1 and g. We, that's just optimizing respect to only one weight and one function. That's definitely doable. So we pick that one. So we fit then once we select our alpha 1 g1, they're going to and they're going to stay frozen. We're not going to change at all. Okay. Then we move to find well. Suppose my alpha 1 g1 is already there in my in my expression. What is optimal choice for my second choice alpha 2 and g2? Plug into an objective function, and you um, you know solve alpha 2 g2. And then alpha g2 along with alpha 1 g1 are going to stay frozen and look for the third uh, optimal choice. So do that sequentially. Um, so for different, there's a sort of a whole um, collection of algorithm or and sort of a categorized under the name boosting, um, but they may be slightly different. It depends on how they're going to choose the loss function, depends on how they're going to choose the so-called base models. And is that going to be a regression model or going by classification tree? And also how they do the optimization at step one. They could be slightly different. So first, let's look at uh, um, the adult boosting. So in adult boosting, we actually use the so-called exponential loss, right? I mentioned this before. And let's look at if we use exponential loss, suppose we are at time t or iteration t, meaning we have already um, figure out what are the optimal choice for the previous t minus 1 and, you know, functions. They stay frozen. So f sub t minus 1 just fixed. And then now we wanted to find out what is the optimal alpha energy to minimize exponential loss. So let's express exponential loss at every end data point xi. So it's e to the power minus yi times that sum. So we expand it. And then this term is fixed because we observe yi. We have already fixed f sub t minus 1. So that becomes the weight, right? I can, this becomes the product of this term times each part, each part and this term. So this basically is our weight at time t because we have already known every expression in this term. Agree? So that's how we do the weighting in the adder boosting. So and now Adam Boosting is going to solve this again um, as a t iteration t. The only thing different uh, from iteration to iteration is that my um, you know weight and um, will be different for all the observations. Okay, so that's no number one. Number two, actually, at a, at a, at a, for the Adam Boosting, we um, we have two arguments alpha and g, right? Alpha is the weight, g is the classifier, base classifier we want to pick. We actually even relax, um, you know, the optimization. We're just going to randomly pick a g. That's it's okay. Let's just randomly pick a g. <coughs> then we wanted to optimize alpha, right? So if we random pick a g, and then we want to pick alpha to 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 minimize this. Now let's just go back to one of the expression we had before. So that's exactly what's this expression here, right now. This and um, GT is fixed. We just wanted to find what is optimal alpha. Okay, and um, then you can actually the weights are also given because for every observation i, um, you can find out the exponential expression only take two different values. Um, so you can find out, and the ZT is basically equal to a sum of two terms. Again, only thing you don't know, uh, well, then you can simplify to be some expression like this. You know epsilon t because you know the weights. And you already pick your classifier g sub t, so you know who get misclassified and who get correctly classified. So you can calculate epsilon t. So the only thing you don't know is epsilon t, or alpha t. This is a simple function, right? Take derivative respect to alpha and find what is alpha can minimize this. And turns out the alpha that can minimize this is going to take this expression. Okay, so this is what adder boosting, and if you think about what adder boosting is doing, um, we basically use exponential loss. We sequentially um, fit our model at time t. At time t, we have already fit, we fixed the previous t minus one observations, and we we examine the exponential loss, and our fitting um, from the pre previous t minus one steps becomes the weight, and then we still need to find optimal alpha and g. And we just randomly pick a G, just try to optimize respect to alpha. 
So this is the algorithm. Okay. Clear? Good. So this is for an add up boosting for classification. And we also have talked about how we do um, boosting with regression. So suppose we use um, you know square loss. And then at every location at, at time t, we um, basically wanted to um, you know check the square error at the i observation, and that's just y i and uh, you know minus the previous it and fitting and plus the new the, the new um, the new function we we're going to use, and then you can merge the first two terms. Basically, y i minus whatever. Um, function you have already learned till time t minus one. That's your new residual, right? Your partial residual is given, and the remaining basically just a regression problem. And in this case, you can think about really we don't need two arguments. We can just merge alpha into g, right? Because that's just a scale term. And so at this iteration, what you can do is, for example, you can just randomly pick a um, feature. I should really. You can just try, randomly pick a feature, maybe it's the first um, predictor, and then just you estimate the corresponding coefficient. So you can do it that way. And, or you can just try to be uh, optimal and just run a regression with the current residual. Um, then in that case, you basically can just set your alpha to be 1 and just find the optimal regression function. So this is how we do um, boosting with regression if our loss function is actually L2 loss. Um, so you can find out um, when we do boosting for simple for classification with exponential loss, we have this nice um, interpretation for boosting algorithm because of this reweighting and mechanism. For square loss and uh, for the regression case, again we have this nice interpretation at time at at time t, we basically get our so, sort of a new residual. And so those are very nice because the underlying loss function is pretty uh, simple. But if your uh, loss function and L is actually, it won't take a simple form, and then you have to do some approximation. And the approximation basically tailor expansion. This is why the underlying algorithm called grade and gradient boosting, I would say, I don't want to say too much because um, I initially plan to explain GBM, but then realized probably GBM going to be going to be retired. <laughs> so what's the point of explaining GBM? Mm -hmm. And actually, I did att attach something um, on the on the forum. Um, for example, let's see. So we have our case. Oh, so yeah, there's a, XG Boost is much, much faster, and Light GBM is a new version of GBM, I think by Microsoft. I haven't tried um, that package, but X, um, XG Boost is definitely um, you know, something you want to put in your um, toolbox. Now, there's a new thing called Cat Boost, means the cat is not, the, not, not cat or dog that cat, but it's the categorical. So they have a different way of coding the categorical variable. So because XG Boost can only take numerical input, so you have to do your DOMI coding everything um, for the categorical variables. And there's a very nice review uh, introduction on GBM. And I think you have seen this before um, when we talk about AIMS data. And there's also a, a nice um, a set of uh, slides talking about uh, and, you know, the underlying um, technical details for, um, for XGBoost. I'll just jump over the part and just sort of point out how you're going to understand the, the uh, underlying algorithm. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay. So additive modeling, right? As I said, um, so at time t, this is the objective function we aim to uh, minimize. Uh, in their setup, they even add the omega, which is a penalty, like L1 or L2. That's sort of a new thing. Now, how we... Um, how we do our um, how we can just do our um, you know um, minimization over L. Let's consider the square error loss, right? So it's y i minus the fitting from the previous t minus one plus the function g, the current function you want to estimate and take square. And I mentioned before, you actually want to merge y i minus the previous iteration as your new residual, right? So previously I said. Um, can I write on this? Yeah. 
So um, Scribbles here said you wanted to uh, rewrite the objective function at t minus 1 for L2 loss as yi minus iteration from this one and minus the new function. So this is now your new residual. So you just new residual um, minus ft xi x squared. So this is pretty simple, right? But they did it, uh, they purposely formulated it in a different way due to some reason you're going to see why. Instead, um, they uh, expand this quadratic term, but you're only going to keep terms relevant to f because f is an argument, right? So you take, you know, square, I mean, this, this two, you can look at this difference, right? So this guy's square has nothing to do with f, drop to the constant, and you have that inner product here and this guy's square, right? Keep this term. We'll see why. Now, uh, so this is for regression case. And then you look at the case for a general classification, general loss function L, we're just going to do Taylor expansion. So what is the Taylor, what is the L and F are related? So the X basically is equal to um, YI hat superscript T minus one. And that delta X is the F sub T X I. So just do a Taylor expansion, okay? So once you do a Taylor expansion, you're going to find out that uh, you know L on the top is equal to something like this. Now you're going to see why you want to do why why you want to um, look at this one. This one is a constant you just ignore because it has nothing to do with the F. You have those terms. This is a gradient, and this is second gradient. This is you know, gradient and and second gradient. Right? So you do Taylor expansion. Now you're going to go back to match. Well, when we have something like this, a quadratic function involving f, there's a way we can formulate it as a least square problem. Okay? When our argument f, which is unknown function, the, the fit at xi, if the loss function looks like this, is a quadratic function of, of f, we can make it look like a regression problem. Because, um, you know, you do a residual blah, 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 right? Can make this look at a quadratic function of, of f. And then if you do, in general, <coughs> your expansion, you're going to find out, well, again, if I do Taylor expansion to the second order, I get a quadratic function of F2. So you can start matching how I'm, when I try to minimize this, how can I just sort of going to run a pseudo regression problem with some kind of a residual, and of course, going to, and some kind of weights because there's a second derivative here. So this is why, and previously at this step, He's actually purposely going to do this expansion. Just want to match with what um, you know he's going to use in a general um, form. So in short, uh, what I want to point out in, is that GBM, even previously the GBM XG and XGBoost, although they're all called um, you know gradient boosting machines, um, but the underlying algorithms are slightly different. Because I think GBM they just directly uh, use the gradient as a pseudo pseudo residual to fit a regression tree. So sort of back to um, my comment here, once you know the general framework of boosting, essentially you have a bunch of a base models. You um, just go through a kind of a grade and sequentially or recursively try to add more uh, you know, base models into your, your final model. You do that by uh, you know, uh, use this so-called um, forward stage device optimization algorithm. But for different algorithms, the way they update, they solve this equation one could be slightly different. Um, but at the end, you probably don't care that much. As long as it's a black box, you know the base model, you know how to kill some of the parameters, then you can just take the output from, from the model. Okay, so um, happy holidays. <laughs> Enjoy your um, assignment.